6.9 on the Richter scale. Hang on! Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host, with another marvellous video. Big Trouble in Little China is a beloved 1980s film that showed the era's pop culture magic in its truest and purest form. The movie follows the adventures of Jack Burton, a witty and stereotypical 80s tough guy, as he deals with an array of bizarre and supernatural encounters. These include ancient Chinese sorcerers, elemental villains, martial arts battles, underwater torture chambers, monsters and even Kim Cattrall. People sit tight, hold the fort, and keep the home fires burning. And if we're not back by dawn, call the president. Fast forward to Boom Studios' comic series, Old Man Jack, set 34 years into the future. Here, we find an elderly Jack living in seclusion in Palatka, Florida. Jack's retreat stems from a world-altering event in 2010 when he unintentionally unleashed the self-proclaimed god of the East called Ching Dai. While Jack enjoins a serene haven, the rest of the world has plunged into chaos, known as the Hellpocalypse. The comic's standout feature is its humor, a blend of writer Anthony Birch's wit and the influence of legendary B-movie icon John Carpenter, who directed, wrote, and composed the original film. The humor permeates the story, even in the direst of situations. The story delves into a version of Hell reminiscent of Dante's Inferno, with circles of punishment based on transgressions. In this video, we'll explore all 12 issues of Old Man Jack, a comic that infuses humor into the big trouble in Little China universe, maintaining the franchise's cult classic reputation. While the art style may not be everyone's cup of tea, the comic promises an entertaining and quirky continuation of Jack Burton's adventures. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. Jack is older, not wiser. So, ten years before the events of the comic, Ching Dai, the demon god of the east, was unleashed upon the earthly realms, but no one really knows how or why. After coming to power, he combined the world of the living with the infinite underworlds of the afterlife. Subsequently, reality was divided into two realms, the world of the living and the world of the dead. However, once Ching Dai took control, the two worlds became one. Now, the world that was once Earth became what is known as Hellpocalypse. Here, the horrors of Hell run rampant over the world of the living. Those who survive Ching Dai's ascension live in fear of the Hellspawn. Those who die in Hellpocalypse are sent somewhere far worse than the underworld that had taken over Earth. They're sent to nothingness, to oblivion itself, forever. And Ching Dai himself lords over all, sitting atop his throne of skulls. As long as he rules from his throne in San Francisco's Chinatown, no soul will ever find peace. Nothing in the Hellpocalypse is what it seems. If the place cannot kill a person from without, it will attempt to devour the person's mind from within. But what if the subject is someone like Mr. Burton, who doesn't have a lot going on on the inside? Well, the demons would simply starve in the attempt. The comic actually begins with Jack Burton living the best life in the abandoned town of Palatka, Florida. He had the entire town to himself. The reason? Well, a hellish fire raged on the borders of the town and no one but Jack Burton got the keys to the kingdom. It was one of those sunny but lazy days while Mr. Burton was chilling and bathing in his loneliness, but the monotony was broken when he heard the voice of a woman on his radio. She said, and I quote, I'm in the house of agony, being pursued by demons. If they find me, they'll tear me from limb to limb. The woman was asking Burton to come and rescue her. In no mood to quit reading his difficult literature with hot women covering the pages, Jack initially shrugged the woman off despite her telling him that she was an extremely attractive young blonde. But our man Jack was a strong man, not easily swayed by women, but that didn't last for long. He got into his iconic and uber-cool truck and drove it straight through the hellfire. According to Jack himself, lesser men would quake at the sight of the wall of unnatural hellfire, <laughs> but not him. He was a man of plan and action. What was his plan, you ask? Well, he liked to keep it simple. Get in, grab the girl, get out. He did have the steps right, but the execution part was missing. Maybe he wanted to cross the bridge when he reached it. Mm. Throughout the journey, he and the woman were connected through the radio, but she would come and go, often telling him how she was in absolute danger. Eventually, he did reach the House of Agony, which was basically the hell of minor discomforts. You know, you'd be tormented with stuff like lukewarm water or a doorknob that gives little shocks or texts from the woman you liked, but she'd say nothing more than, okay. Of course, old man Jack Burton wouldn't find himself limited or restricted by such crappy torments. After humiliating his tormentor, Jack continues his search for the damsel in distress, and eventually he did find her, but of course this was no damsel in distress. It was David Lopin, the monster from the first movie, who had tricked Jack Burton into coming to see him, and he was not dead. I guess there are no surprises there. 
Do we call this a new bromance? So, David Lopin was here, in the flesh, but this guy was not the usual ghostly self, which old man Jack Burton realized after landing an Alabama death punch right on Lopin's face. Interestingly, the former undead guy wanted to make peace with Burton and set aside their differences. In fact, Lopin wanted Burton's help, which surprised the old man. Burton had many questions for the good old Davy, but he wouldn't stop talking. Anyway, Lopin managed to shut Burton up and began describing how it was that he came back after dying all those years ago. When Ching Dai took over Earth, Lopin was overjoyed. He went to Ching Dai to express how he felt, but Ching Dai was angry with Lopin, holding him in shame for creeping on women with green eyes and dying at the hands of a mere mortal with a mullet. And the demon god asked if this was what loyal service meant. Ching Dai was angry about the shameful and embarrassing deeds that Lopin had done in his name and cast the false servant out of the good graces, but not before making him immortal again. So, that's how Lopin ended up in the House of Agony and needed Jack's help to get out of the place. Initially resentful, Jack agreed, but there was more. Lopan knew how to kill Ching Dai and save the world from his hellish wrath. The plan was to go to San Francisco and slay Ching Dai. In fact, Lopan had spent several years preparing for it, but he needed a ride to cross the thousand miles of hellscape that stood between him and Chinatown. But Jack was reluctant to pick up a hitchhiker who was once a ghost-like acolyte demon and kick Davy back to where he came from. Jack carried on with his journey through the post-apocalyptic world. He was missing being in the company of a woman when he saw this warrior lady in the middle of the road. Of course, she was not alone. There were others, survivors. It seems like they happened to take Jack Burton as some sort of a prophesied savior, a messiah who would rid them of evil and rid the world of Ching Dai's wrath. They believed that Burton was sent by an entity called the Beast, a creature of vengeance and strength who refused to accept extinction at the hands of Hell's armies. However, a messenger from the Beast arrived to reveal that Jack Burton was the greatest enemy. Of course, Jack was apprehended immediately and began the preparations to kill him. We even get to meet a horrific monster whose head was sticking out of the Earth's surface and was prepared to chew Burton and spit him out, because apparently the beast did not eat swearsies. Interestingly, Burton, in a moment of panic, spits out that he didn't intentionally release Ching Dai and that he was just trying to do something good. But just as he was about to be devoured, David Lopan appeared at the scene. It turns out that although Lopan had become mortal again, he managed to retain his powers. Before letting out the blinding light from his mouth in an attempt to escape, he asked Burton to close his eyes. But that stupid bloke couldn't even follow that one instruction and became temporarily blind. Poor Burton wanted Lopin to do the whole on the count of three thing in this life and death situation. Anyway, Lopin saved Burton, and the two of them managed to flee by riding off on Burton's prized steed, the Pork Chop Express. The comic ended as they drove straight into the ocean of fire that could infiltrate their mind and turn them mad. The Bridge of Flesh As the two of them crossed the ocean of fire, David Lopin was warning his newfound friend about how the physical dangers of the fire were nothing compared to the mental trickery it could subject you to. Curiously enough, Lopin himself fell victim to the same. He saw a vision of Miao Yin, the green-eyed girl from the movie whom Lopin wanted to marry. The hallucinated apparition seemed to have had a change of heart. Apparently, she was now super into weird dudes with goatees. Davy opened the truck's door, but Burton reminded him that Miao Yin hated him, much like all other women. But the hellfire didn't spare anyone, so how could it be that Jack Burton would be spared? Wang appeared as an apparition before them. Yes, Wang, the Chinese guy for whom Burton went through so much trouble in the movie. Now, we know that the whole mess about Ching Dai started because of Burton, but what exactly did he do? Well, that's what Wang was here to remind Burton about. Not long before the events of the comic, Wang's daughter planned to get married, and Wang called Burton to let him in on the good news. So, after hearing this, Burton's grand brain had an idea. He wanted to throw Wang a bachelor's party that he never had before marrying Miao Yin. So, the friends went out in Jack's truck, and it so happened that they met with a terrible accident. While trying to save a dog, Jack rammed his truck into a pole, which killed Wang. Clearly shaken by the loss of his friend, that too with his own hand, Jack Burton thought it would be a good idea for a Caucasian to tamper with the underworld and the dark magic of the East. He was warned by Egg Shen, the sorcerer, but to no avail. In the end, Jack contacted Ching Dai, hoping to make a deal with him. But oh boy, he had no idea what he was doing. Ching Dai appeared, and Jack asked him if he could return Wang to the mortal world. Ching Dai agreed, but at a cost. The demon god's price was simple and easy. He just wanted to shake Burton's hand and call him a friend. But as soon as they shook hands, the world turned upside down. Of course, Burton lost his arm, his favorite arm, but more importantly, the hand served as a bridge of flesh for Ching Dai to walk the earth. You see, 
Lo Pan had been Ching Dai's disciple for all those years, and even he wasn't stupid enough to pull something like that. But Jack Burton, being Jack Burton, made quite a deal with the devil and didn't stop to think twice. Lo Pan was furious at what Burton had done and almost threw him out of the running vehicle. And that's exactly what Lo Pan did. To be honest, I don't really blame Lo Pan for that. Burton kinda did bring an apocalypse to the world. If these are the heroes, the world is truly doomed. But you know what? Burton is one tough bird to kill. The old man often says that his knuckles were the third most muscular part of his body, and he held them to good use when he held a bar of his truck to save himself from the deadly fall. And Lo Pan was so busy focused on squishing Burton's digits that he wasn't looking where they were going. Yes, there was another accident, and Burton almost died, but was saved by Pete, the demon who we saw in Lo Pan's weird little sex dungeon in the first movie. In the movie itself, this hairy demon wasn't exactly violent, although he looked like he could devour you and bathe in your blood just for kicks. Both of them would have definitely died had it not been for Pete, which Burton thought was a good name for another worldly demon, something which clearly pissed Lo Pan off. So, after the events of the movie, Burton had somewhat adopted Pete, but the demon lived on its own. But Pete wasn't serving any of them anymore. He was on the side of the Children of the Beast, the people who wanted Burton dead. But now they wanted both Lo Pan and Burton dead, or at least they wanted them to atone for their crimes. And now they were supposed to face the Beast himself. It turns out that Wang was the beast, the leader of all these men and women. Burton believed that Ching Dai didn't keep his end of the bargain, but clearly that wasn't quite the case. Wang had become somewhat of an exceptionally skilled fighter, berating Burton left, right and centre. But why was he doing that? Well, he was furious about Burton's grand idea of trifling with powers he didn't understand. He was clearly not happy about being back from the dead because it was something that torched the world, literally. And then, Wang turned his attention to David Lo Pan, who Pete was determined to destroy in his attempt to rid the world of every wretched foul thing from the face of the earth. But just as Lo Pan was about to land his final blow, Burton intervened and saved him. Again. But Wang wasn't happy about Burton's mistake. Well, the outspoken man wasn't going to have it anymore and lashed out. But Burton finally shut up once Wang revealed that his family was dead. In fact, Wang wanted to kill Lo Pan, and would have done the deed had it not been for Burton, who requested Wang to spare Lo Pan, claiming that he was the only one who knew to destroy Ching Dai. Wang reluctantly agreed, and claimed that the three of them would travel to the Throne of Skulls. And to be honest, it would have been foolish to let fools like Burton and Lo Pan undertake such a big responsibility, so Wang was going to be their leader, and maybe even their guardian. It wasn't long before that the three men reached what they called the River of Fire. Crossing it would begin the last leg of their journey, but it wasn't going to be easy. No weatherman could predict the three storms. Wang was threatening the other two with killing them for just about anything. The last one was that he'd kill them both if Lo Pan didn't know how to infiltrate Ching Dai's throne, something that Lo Pan assured he knew. However, while they made a pit stop, Lo Pan approached Burton while the latter was taking a leak. Now, this was indeed a crime worthy of death. <laughs> I mean, you don't speak to a guy when he's doing his business, right? Hmm, and that's one of the most basic rules of any country's bro code. Nevertheless, Lo Pan revealed that he didn't know what he'd earlier promised. Burton thought it would be a good opportunity to make Wang like him again by telling Wang the truth. Wang asked what was going on, and Burton almost spilled the beans, but Lo Pan convinced him otherwise. To cover up, Burton went on about how he and Lo Pan were talking about their emotional vulnerabilities and having a heart-to-heart, -heart. but that was not Burton, so Lo Pan suggested he spoke about beans or something, and Burton said he was telling Lo Pan how he loved beans, which actually convinced Wang that there was something wrong. To buy time, Burton told Wang that they needed to find the three storms, yes, the super-powered guys from the movie, but how would they find those guys? Well, Wang summoned Pete, who was bound by oath never to leave Wang's side. Now, Pete had the ability to sniff creatures of great sin, but even the most skilled canines need something to sniff and follow the scent, right? Hmm. Lo Pan had just the thing, the red ball that belonged to Rain, which he had blown right into Burton's gut in the movie, if you'd remember. Wang asked Lo Pan what if the three storms refused to follow his orders to join the fight, but the former demon was pretty overconfident, going on about how they were once his minions and would follow him to death and all that. But of course, there was a catch. Following Pete, they finally reached the Three Storms and they were kinda living up to their names. Seeing Wang and Burton was not a happy experience for the Three Storms, but what really pissed them off was Lo Pan calling him their master. Lo Pan thought that he was the brains and they were his eternal servants, but they were mildly pissed off about Lo Pan abandoning them and for the stupid manner in which Lo Pan died. Now, they changed their allegiances and were serving Ching Dai directly. Of course, there was going to be a battle. Wang took on Rain and Lo Pan challenged Lightning, which left Thunder to Burton. Burton thought it was rather embarrassing for Thunder to be named after the sound of lightning. 
Like, imagine if one of your friends was officially named Fart or Sneeze. But then again, who are we to judge? Unfortunately, even Thunder Storm Brothers were making fun of the poor guy's name. While the others fought, Burton was actually talking to his new friend Thundy, telling him how concepts like family and friendship were a bunch of horseshit, and how loneliness was an idea propagated by commies. I guess he forgot that Thunder was from China. Anyway, Thunder opened up about how his brothers humiliated him and all that. Surprisingly, Burton was really getting under his skin like a skilled shrink. He was about to reveal the secret to getting into Qing Dai's throne when his brothers were killed by Wang and Lo Pan. Well, that ticked poor Thundee off. He once again began to increase in size to Godzilla-like stature, but fortunately for Lo Pan, Burton and Wang, Thundee brought them exactly where they wanted to be, the Throne of Skulls. Or maybe it was not that fortunate. The Curious Case of Egg Shen They say hell is other people, but the hell in which our friends found themselves, people were replaced by centaurs with knives in their hands. This minion of Ching Dai's hell was kind of different than our biblical demons who torture you physically for pleasure. The centaur with knives was more into psychological torture than physiological. But before he could do something about it, Thunder arrived and took over the torture. However, Thunder didn't want to kill Jack, he wanted to give Burton a punishment much worse. So, Thunder set him free. Jack would still roam around Ching Dai's labyrinth, but he'd suffer the brunt of old age and witness the loss of his friends. On the other hand, Lo Pan found himself in the company of a beautiful woman who was sent to torture him. She tried humiliation, but it turned out that he actually started enjoying it, and humiliation was now one of his things. The woman, disgusted by Lo Pan's idea of sensuous delight, turned into a giant boar, but Lo Pan didn't like being kink-shamed. Humiliation didn't work on him, and since he'd spent centuries in the body of an immortal old man, he and Pain were friends. With pain and humiliation out of the picture, Lopan's torturer resorted to sending him to oblivion, the nothingness where even he couldn't perceive himself. Meanwhile, Burton was running with his life when he came across a signboard, but couldn't read it because of his failing elderly eyes. To make things worse, he even developed back pain, all signs of being old and decaying. He had all these adventures, but now he was standing at the end of the road, an old, broken man, dying at the end of the world with no friends. Gracie had died during Ching Dai's ascension when a building collapsed on her. On the other hand, Wang hated him. You may wonder where Wang was, but I'll come to that in a bit. On the other hand, Lopan was being pushed into oblivion by the boar-shaped torturer. However, Burton was trying his best to agitate Thunder so he'd get angry and explode once again. But this time around, Thunder knew what Jack was trying to do, so Jack pulled another trick. He instigated the centaur with knives to fight Thunder. You see, the centaur was more than willing to believe that he was being insulted by Thunder, and as the two of them engaged in a duel, Jack fled from the scene. Meanwhile, in a desperate attempt to save himself, Lopan pulled a classic Jack Burton and landed a redneck sucker punch on the boar before laying an epic punt to the privates. Lopan escaped his supposed hell and bumped into Burton. Lopan wanted to escape the hell, but Burton reminded him that they first needed to get hold of Wang. So, despite the fact that Wang wanted to kill him, Jack didn't wish to lose another friend. They didn't have any idea about Wang's whereabouts until they saw Pete, who was bound by oath to stick around Wang. They knew that Wang would be somewhere close. After finding him, the three decided to find Egg Shen's Book of Spells and Sorcery and summon him, because only he would know how to kill or send Ching Dai back. But here's the twist. The centaur with knives informed them that Egg Shen was, in fact, alive and kept somewhere in the Throne of Skulls. So now the men had a new mission. Oh, and yeah, the centaur and our guy Burton had kind of become friends. In fact, Burton called the centaur his personal minion, but Burton should have remembered that this guy was ultimately a demon. Just where is the Pork Chop Express headed next? So, finally, a plan was made. The centaur pretended to capture all four of them and brought them to the Throne of Skulls to face justice, whatever justice was in the eyes of Ching Dai. One of the humanoid horse guards asked if the centaur was going to torture them all together, to which he said, Oh, absolutely, and on an unrelated note, do you remember where Egg Shen is being tortured? I want to hear their screams and vice versa. After learning the location of Egg Shen's holding cell, which so happened to be between the scorpion waterbed and the chamber of flesh-eating dads, they went inside and unchained themselves. But Thunder screwed everything as he stuck his big sword through the centaur, presumably killing him. He'd managed to lure everyone into the Throne of Skulls and was waiting to be appreciated and rewarded by his master, Ching Dai. In an attempt to escape Thunder, they ran and shut themselves in a strange room. Well, they did that on Burton's orders, but Lo Pan wasn't happy. I mean, he made a good point. This is a Chinese hell. I don't visit a white guy purgatory and start telling you where everything is. Nevertheless, the room they were in was housing innumerable ghost children, so they got out of there and managed to reach the room where Egg Shen was present. They didn't just save Egg Shen, but he also got hold of his book, 
the source of his powers. The next leg of the plan was for Egg Shen to pull off some magic or read some spell that would make Ching die mortal again. Then, all they had to do was kill the mortal demon who was only the size of the Statue of Liberty. Simple. Wang didn't want Burton to accompany them because of his knack for screwing things up, as usual. Unfortunately for everyone, the book was locked, which was a serious problem. Because without the key, Ching Dai could not be banished. They had two options. Look for the key and get killed, or forget the book, fight Ching Dai and get killed anyway. In both cases, the world would suffer. But Burton had an idea, or let me rephrase, he had a solution. He figured that Thunder had the key, which he wore as a necklace. So, Burton wanted Egg Shen to teleport him to Thunder, where he would talk Thunder into giving the key up. The plan sounded ridiculous to everyone, but they didn't have anything else to do. Burton was sent to Thunder, who wanted to kill Burton. However, Burton was trying to get under Thunder's skin again. Burton said that if he got killed, Thunder would be losing his only friend, but Thunder knew what he was trying to do. So, Burton changed the strategy and said, I realized something about you, you're useless. But wait, he wasn't trying to humiliate Thunder, he was still trying to connect with him. Burton continues, You're the third wheel, the comic relief. You make more problems than you solve. And if you disappeared off the face of this crappy excuse of a planet, it wouldn't make a lick of a difference. But do you know how I know all this? Because you and me, we're the same. The more Burton talked, the more Thunder began to see the truth. But as soon as Thunder gave the key to Burton, Lopan killed Thunder. Burton was furious. He actually saw a bit of himself in Thunder and wanted to kill Lopan, but more trouble awaited them. You see, the only way to destroy or banish Ching Dai was through killing the Flesh Bridge, who was none other than our old man, Jack Burton. Lopan named the dumbest man alive. Quite obviously, Burton didn't like the idea of committing suicide or getting killed, as Egg Shen had suggested. So, Burton knocked Egg Shen down and fled from the scene, along with the book. He found himself a nice cozy room in hell and started a ritual to bargain with Ching Dai himself. But before he did that, he created a nearly impenetrable blood barrier that would protect him from external assault from his friends. The barrier could be broken by Lo Pan, but it would take time. And then again, even if they managed to infiltrate, Jack Burton was one of the most unkillable guys walking the earth. I mean, Lo Pan had defeated demons, killed kings, and tamed the three storms. But he couldn't kill Jack Burton. According to Lo Pan himself, the reason was that Jack Burton was the dumbest man alive. He was so inept and irrelevant to the challenges laid before him that he'd become the embodiment of irrelevance and thereby become the god of uselessness, which made him rather unstoppable. So, you know, it was quite possible that Burton might just kill all four of them by just falling flat on them. That was his bane and boon. Here's where things get interesting, though. Jack's will kept the barrier strong, and only hatred for him would bring it down and they all started remembering the things Jack Burton did to hurt or harm them. Meanwhile, Burton summoned Ching Dai. Jack threatened Ching Dai with suicide, which would ultimately destroy Ching Dai, and the Demon God of the East couldn't help but agree to what Jack demanded. He wanted Ching Dai to bring Miao Yin and Winona back from the dead. Upon coming back to the world, Miao Yin saw Lo Pan and unleashed some good old feminine fury on Lo Pan. I guess she punched him so much and so ferociously that his jaw broke. But unfortunately, Burton had inadvertently given Ching Dai the access to heaven when he asked him to bring Wang's family back. He was now at his weakest, but still a demon god that needed to be slain. And if they waited long enough for Ching Dai to take over heaven, the fabric of reality itself would change. But Wang was now on Jack's side, and Jack was once again the hero for doing the unimaginable. Can every man, woman, and demon just get along? To be honest, this was an extremely strange situation. The fate of all humanity rested in the hands of an old coot, an idiot, his martial artist friend, his beautiful wife, their daughter, and, well, how can we possibly describe David Lopin? The sorcerer was reminiscing about how stupid this warrior group was and how they managed to keep him alive, but then something happened. Ching Dai appeared before Lopin to speak to him in private. Clearly, our guy Ching Dai was at his weakest. That's why he was here to make a deal with a mere servant, David Lopan. So, the demon god of the East made Lopan an offer he almost couldn't refuse. Ching Dai needed a new flesh bridge as Burton was weak, and Ching Dai offered godlike powers to Lopan if he chose to become the flesh bridge. But before he could come to a decision, Jack interrupted him. The new plan was for Egg Shen to cast a spell that would bring Ching Dai to the size of a human, but while he recited the spell, he'd become defenseless and would need protection. Also, they'd have to contend with numerous minions of the Demon Guard. The group reached Ching Dai's throne room in the Tower of Skulls and a fierce battle ensued. While Winona and Miao Yin battled a wolf demon, Burton took on another, but his own mistake got him falling through a small structure. He got saved after his shirt got stuck in the stones of one of the pillars, but he still needed protection. Pete came to his rescue, but Thunder reappeared and killed Pete, which obviously devastated Burton and Wang, Pete's master. Wang then engaged Thunder in a duel, who was pissed that Lopan had punched a hole into his chest. 
By now, Qing Dai had come to his full strength and was about to launch his fiercest attack, which he, in fact, did. However, Egg Shen had managed to cast his spell by now and brought Qing Dai to size. But Egg Shen was grievously injured as Qing Dai's magic had punched a hole through him. Egg Shen was dying, and Lo Pan wasn't happy about it. You see, Lo Pan said that no one messes with his arch enemy but he. Anyway, things were not looking good for the team because despite being human-sized, Qing Dai was looking rather invincible. But Jack got hold of Egg Shen's book and was looking for a cool spell to destroy the demon god of the east, but he was running out of time. But Lo Pan had a plan. He asked everyone to try, or at least pretend, to kill Burton. This would distract Qing Dai, which would give others the opportunity to kill the demon god. And you know what? The plan actually worked. While Qing Dai tried to save Burton from Winona's sword attack, Miao Yin stabbed Qing Dai. Unfortunately, though, in one impulsive move, Lo Pan chose to become the flesh bridge for Qing Dai, and they both merged into one body. But what was worse was that the new demon god Lo Pan killed Wang. It's a head-popping good time. But he didn't just kill Wang. Lo Pan killed everyone else too, including Winona and Miao Yin. Burton had lost all his friends and was all alone with the grief of failing them all and pushing them to their deaths. Furthermore, with his newfound powers, Lo Pan wanted to kill God himself to become the ruler of everything. Now, that can't be good by any measure. If he managed to invade heaven, he'd also destroy the souls of everyone present there and rid the world of all things good. In Star Wars style, Egg Shen appeared before old man Jack Burton to give him some sage advice from the beyond. But more than advice, it felt like he was there to freak Burton with the gigantic responsibility burdening his old shoulders. You see, now that Lo Pan had Ching Dai's powers, even the armies of heaven would fail before him, and only Jack Burton could save the world, as well as heaven. Egg Shen asked him to come up with a plan, and Jack Burton wasn't really good at planning and plotting, was he? Our man was running out of options when Thunder once again presented himself. Lo Pan had hired him as one of the torturers, but no matter what Thunder did, Burton wouldn't feel a sting. You see, according to Burton, he'd found a new superpower called depression, which stopped him from feeling just about anything. I can't say he was entirely wrong. Anyway, their conversation reminded Burton of something, or rather, some people. He remembered the army that followed Wang, the beast, and he wanted Thunder to deliver the message to them. If he did, Burton would allow Thunder to kill him, or better yet, torture him. Thunder claimed that he could kill Burton in an instant if he wanted to, but Burton rightly pointed out that better men than him had tried and failed. In fact, even Burton had tried that on numerous occasions, but to no avail. The prospect of becoming the dude who killed Jack Burton seemed intriguing to Thunder, and he agreed to do Burton's bidding. So they shook on it, and as was promised, Thunder snapped Burton's neck, sending him to heaven. Upon reaching the gates of heaven, Burton was greeted by this old man with white hair and a long white beard. Nevertheless, before he could enter into heaven, his sins had to be calculated. But the scales were equal. Burton had good deeds just as many as his bad ones. But ultimately, he was led inside heaven. Actually, the gatekeeper's head exploded before Burton. You see, that's how irritating Burton can get at times. Once inside heaven, he was greeted by this fish-like creature who was supposed to be the assistant to people in heaven. It soon became clear to this fish assistant thing that the gatekeeper was dead, and it blamed Burton for it. But we knew that our guy was innocent. Burton headed to the waiting room of heaven, which was supposed to be just past the junk food palace. Burton found Wang, who also saved him from the giant puffer fish, Esmeralda. Anyway, Burton brought Wang up to speed with what Lob Pan was up to, but Wang had something more important in mind. He wanted Burton to meet someone special. Yes, the beautiful Gracie had been waiting for Burton. Well, as they say, through heaven and hell, long lost love. However, Burton was more interested in his truck than Gracie, and he just ran past her like she didn't exist. After making some short love to his long lost truck, Burton turned his attention to Gracie, who seemed like she hadn't aged a day. But she was married, and even her husband was up there with her. Anyway, this was no time for catching up with old folks, as Lo Pan had brought the fight to heaven itself. The angelic guards refused to join the fray because they were forbidden from meddling with human affairs, and Lo Pan was still technically a human. So, it was all up to the mighty Jack Burton. He asked his friends to gather all the warriors who ever lived. They came, but some of them came because they'd been promised cake and stuff. For instance, Joan Dark soon proclaimed that she was Joan de Outer Here. Well, I can't really blame her. Jack then remembered the Chang Sing, the gang that had been fighting Lo Pan in real life for hundreds of years. So, things had started to look even for the good guys. Jack then made a certain deal with Ms. Giant Pufferfish, which I'll tell you about in a bit. The confidence with which Jack was doing things was weird. It almost seemed as if he knew what he was doing. And that's very unlike Jack Burton, the walking mess. Well, the pillars of heaven were shaking, and lesser men had run to hide behind their mama's skirt tails. They were facing off against an army of the damned, 
and old man Jack Burton got into his mighty old truck and rammed straight into the army. On the other hand, Wang was trying to get hold of Egg Shen and the Chang Sing. Jack did what he could, and it wasn't before long that he was confronting Lo Pan face to face. But of course, Lo Pan was way more powerful for Jack to kill. He'd made a pact with the Pufferfish, according to which he'd get a demon-slaying weapon, much like the one he used in the movie, and his truck, but in return, he'd have to give up his claim to the Halo, which meant he could never enter heaven again. Jack had agreed because that was the right thing to do. Just as Lopan was about to land a final blow on Burton, he realized that Burton's friends had arrived there. But that was not all. There was Miao Yin, Egg Shen, Winona, the entire army that followed Wang when he was the beast, as well as the Chang Sing. Clearly, there was big trouble in heaven for Lopan. And with that, we move to the last leg of the journey, the last issue of the comic. The most difficult thing to do is talk. When you're his age, you think more about how you're gonna die. Jack Burton had his preferences. Of course, asphyxiation by Sloppy Joe, heart attack by Truck Shop Beauty. But dying at the hands of a perverted zombie sorcery god wasn't one of them. But Jack Burton had lived a long and eventful life. He wasn't blessed with a lot of brains, but he had something even better. He had luck, and he had a gun that shot god-killing bullets. The army of the beast charged the damned demons. The fight was weird and nasty. There was blood, dead people dying again, demons dying. There was even Hitler fighting for Lo Pan. But Egg Shen took care of him, so that's that. However, the armies of the damned were overrunning heaven, and there was chaos. Utter chaos. If Lo Pan won, he'd take over heaven and enslave everyone. In fact, his ultimate goal now was slaying God himself. <laughs> the omnipotent kind. The good one. Now, that couldn't be a good thing by any measure. But there was some additional bad news. The pufferfish was basically a wish granter. She was bound to serve the requests made to her, even if they came from an invader. Unfortunately, Lo Pan heard it. He asked her to create a mechanism by which one could control the entire existence. The fish obliged and created the ultimate seat of authority. Whoever sat on it would gain control and dominion over all worlds. But of course, our friend Jack Burton wouldn't let Lo Pan have it so easy, so he followed Lo Pan as he made his move toward this ultimate seat of authority. As it happened, both of them sat on the seat together, and continuing his streak of banters, Jack said, You know what Jack Burton says when he and his archenemy have both their butts in a throne that gives them power over all time and space? He says, Let's take a drive down memory lane. Right after he said it, the events from the first movie began to repeat themselves, but the characters had been changed. Burton was now Lo Pan and vice versa. It turns out that Burton planned this whole thing. This was to make Lopan realize how very lonely he really was, and how Jack won despite being a mortal. It was only because Jack had friends, that's how he managed to defeat Lopan and his minions in the first place. Lopan finally started to see the truth, and how he'd never really been happy, despite all this power and despite his immortality. Jack tells him that despite bringing an apocalypse, his friends forgave him, and despite killing Wang, he got over it. That's what friends do. All he needs to do in return is throw a few heartfelt apologies here and there. They both got off the chair at once, and Lo Pan said, Everyone, I have been a turd, and I am sorry. I do not expect to earn your forgiveness right away, but I will try to be less of a turd. Then, he ordered his minions to leave hell at once, but the story wasn't quite over. Thunder flung a knife right into Jack's chest. He was going to die. <laughs> that was for sure. But there was a way to send him back in time and live his happiest memory for all eternity. Jack found himself where the first film ended, where he left without kissing Gracie goodbye. But this time around, he returned to her immediately after leaving through the door, and it seems that they lived happily ever after, forever, in fact. Marvelous verdict, the climactic showdown between Jack and Lo Pan in this limited series cleverly blends nostalgia and emotion. Revisiting old scenes with reversed roles adds a unique twist and serves as a metaphor for the power of perspective. Lo Pan's character, iconic and multifaceted, manages to be both menacing and amusing. His redemption feels earned after a series that began with him tricking Jack. George Corona's art and Gabriel Casata's colors mostly maintain their high standard, though some rushed panels lack facial detail. However, they excel in conveying emotional moments and capturing the essence of the original movie scenes. The future of Boom Studios' Big Trouble in Little China series is uncertain, as this limited series won't have successes. The story's contemporary setting leaves room for tales set in the past. Nevertheless, it feels like John Carpenter put his heart into concluding Jack Burton's story on his terms, making this finale special. In summary, this volume is a must-read for franchise fans. Exploring Jack Burton and his twilight years adds depth to the character. Old Man Jack maintains Carpenter's trademark humor and satire, while also delivering a surprisingly heartfelt farewell. As Mel Brooks once said, comedy needs genuine emotion, and this final issue strikes that perfect balance. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone!